thank you guys so much. Truly, we're here for, for Second Chance Hiring. Um, there's so many great folks that are, that are here tonight um, that have already been doing the good work. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here. In fact, I'm just trying to highlight all of the great stuff that so many organizations have been doing. Um, and I can't thank our, our Florida Department of Corrections Secretary, Ricky Dixon, enough. And also, big shout out to Mark Inch in the back too. Um, General Inch, we're uh, truly, you guys have, have really made a difference and your hearts have been changed. And I know that, and you have changed so many other hearts from everything that you guys have done. So really, um, tonight is a chance to kind of highlight everything that's going on on a national level and then talk about just all the good work that we're doing here in Florida. So long with the short, I'm excited to have you all here. <laughs> Hey, thank, thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your interest in, the, in this uh, space that we're in. And um, I'll tell you just a, uh, very shortly, I started about 26 years ago, a lot of you know that, in corrections as a correctional officer. And I, I guess my position then was not very sympathetic to the population that we, uh, that we had in our custody. But as I matured through the, through the process and over the coming years, uh, my, my mindset changed. I started realizing there's a lot of people in there that was not a lot different than I was. A lot of good people that made some bad decisions. A lot of bad people that should never get out. But a lot of good people that, that had bad decisions or bad circumstances in their, in their lives. And, um, and in one way or another, we're going to get out either in two years or five years or ten years. They were going to be released again and be in our shopping malls and our grocery stores and, and theaters. So it started dawning on me that we really need to do better. And even back then, and we've, we've kind of gone downhill and we're working on recovery um, I started uh, gaining an appreciation for educating them. You know, the average education level in our system is sixth grade, a sixth grade education, and giving them vocational skills and training. And so uh, I, I changed in that area, and we're trying to make sure that our staff do as well now. We're hiring a lot of new staff, and we have a lot of turnover. And I guess the message we're trying to share internally with our staff is, and we're excited. We've got a lot of great things happening in our, in our agency to change the mindset of corrections where those young officers don't start like I did, where they start immediately understanding that we're in the corrections business. Our, our title is our title for a reason, and we should be providing those educational and vocational opportunities. And uh, so, you, you know, we're, we're focused on that for several reasons, and you all know this. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. But, but number one, if we keep the population from being idle, if, if we keep them busy, then immediately in our system, the violence goes down. I, idle hands has, has created all kinds of problems in our systems and violence. So if the violence goes down, it's a safer place to work and, and live, and it helps our recruitment and retention efforts, and there's so many immediate wins from, from that. But I say all the time, this shouldn't be a partisan issue. It shouldn't matter if we're liberal or conservative or Democrat or Republican. We all should care. Um, we should care for that reason because many of them deserve a second chance and deserve a chance at a, at a fruitful life and employment. But even if you're not on that side of the fence, if they get out, and, and, and you know this, again, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, if they get out and they're, they're unable to, to find a job, if we give them $50 in a bus pass with no skills, they can't read, then they're probably going to come back to prison. And that's more money on us as taxpayers, and it's more victims. Usually when they come back to prison, there's a victim associated with that return. So, again, I, it, it bewilders me why this would be complicated for anyone. It's, it's so simple, and we should all focus on this area. I'm so proud to tell you the Florida Department of Corrections is absolutely focused on this area. And I won't belabor this and go into all the things we're doing, but we've got internal management strategies to manage our population. That, that I don't know exist anywhere else in the country. There's a few states that are doing some creative things, but the way we're managing the population now, not based on, on necessarily even escape risk and, and violent risk, but behavior, uh, your willingness to, to be in a population that uh, has other like-minded individuals that want to succeed, incentivizing those opportunities, and on the other side, extracting those that would be a distraction from those that want to do well. Um, Secretary Inch is here. One of the things he brought to Florida and we, we gravitated toward and it's been highly successful is we take in a, over 7,000 inmates a year in our population that are getting out within one year. Now, that's a, a conversation for another day. But 7,000 that comes in our system aren't even going to be with us a year. So we're not putting them out in the general population. We're, we're keeping them secluded, and that's reducing the violence levels as well. So all that to say that, you know, internally, at a time you would think our violence level would be escalating and going through the roof, um, we're actually going down. That, that shouldn't be occurring. So that's, that's happening through smart partnerships and, and good population management strategies. When it comes to partnerships, we are going across Florida 
So thank you all for coming to us tonight. <laughs> but we're going all over the state, and we're talking to business leaders. Um, we went to the Associated Industries of Florida event. We went to a chamber event recently, and we're talking to business leaders, and we're telling them if it, not only will we identify individuals leaving our custody that are going to an area near you, we'll move them to an area near you prior to release. Not only will we do that, but we'll give you space in our in our institutions to come in and train them so they're ready to go to work day one. Um, so we're we're opening up doors that we've never opened up figuratively and literally. We're we're, we're providing space um, for the, for those employers to come in and train train them. I believe recidivism is going to continue to go down. We're one of the lowest in the country. We're around 24 percent right now of of those released come back within with th three years. That's that's sad, but it's it's really one of the best statistics out there in terms of recidivism so we're proud of that but we want to do so much better we, we should do uh, so much better than that because of partnerships with with folks like you who are interested in this because of partnerships with business leaders across the state at a very good time years ago we couldn't have had this conversation with a lot of employers we were the same way we could pick and choose who we hired 10 years ago we can't today and and nor can so many vis uh, businesses across the state so timing is right to partner to give these individuals a second chance and to improve our recidivism rate, reduce the crime in Florida, and hopefully reduce our prison population. Thank you for all you do. If we can help you with anything, please let us know. All right, we have a great crew tonight. Um, we do know, and the, and the Secretary mentioned it, 95% of the individuals that go into prison are going to come out one day. We also know that there's about 625,000 people released from prisons back into our communities each year in the United States. And Florida has a great recidivism rate at 24%. Uh, nationally, it's near 38%. And there are some studies that show after about seven, eight years, that could almost double. Um, we're also looking at unemployment being the number one predictor of recidivism that return back to prison. So today, we're gonna, we're gonna talk with our group here uh, about how we can tackle this issue by addressing one of the, the components to reentry, and that's going to be, be employment. Uh, John, we watched you get 20 minutes worth of words in a four-minute video, so we're going to give you a few more minutes. Um, let us know what's going on with, um, with the cottage. Sure. Well, thank you, Scott, and it's a real honor to be here with you, Jerron, Sheena, Carrie, so many experts. I want to thank Julie Warren and Chelsea for having me here tonight as well. Uh, so the thing is this, right? You know, I, I, when we built the program in New Jersey, Scott, you know, Governor Christie wasn't necessarily going to build another social program for the state, right? But once he heard that all of the protective factors, that your social determinants of health are really your social determinants of work, then he got behind it, realizing that, over, that the, the net cost on, on the state is going to be less. So what happens is, you have this situation over the last few years where the economy skyrockets, right? You can't find workers anywhere. We're talking pre-pandemic especially. You can't find workers anywhere. And then that changes a little bit, right? But that starts the conversation. And then thanks to folks at Right on Crime, leaders like, like you and the team over there, right? The conservative movement started to get involved. And when they started to get involved, it was with conservative principles, right? Building prosperity, right? and making sure that people don't commit crimes again. I think that's number one. All this runs to the public safety channel. But again, as I mentioned, I spend my time on the business side. As businesses sit with me, remember I'm a former litigator, so attorneys sit with me, and they say, John, you know, are we gonna get sued? Are they gonna come and, uh, are people with records gonna come mess the whole place up? We don't know how to do it. So what happens is the more coalitions like this get brought together, we have the ability to train the businesses on the right way to do it, to add the most business value, to protect their interest, and in turn, bring opportunity. Thank you, John. Sheena, we're gonna, we're gonna move over here to you. Uh, one of the questions, other than my workout routine, that the people, that was a joke too. I, I see it quieted everyone down, but um, when, when the first visit, I would be asked, I need a job. And the second thing was, how can I get this off my record? I'm like, okay, we're just starting the process here, but you have been doing excellent work across the nation, uh, touching the hearts and minds um, in, in many different states uh, to a really, really critical issue. 
uh, of clearing records and, and getting that expungement process going. Uh, let us know what, what you guys are doing and, and how this relates to reentry and how it relates to employment. Thank you, Scott. And Scott is my dance partner. He didn't put that in there either. But um, I want to thank our partners uh, on Right on Crime. We've been doing some great work together and also uh, Florida Rights Restoration Coalition that's out there. I think, you know, I just want to just ground ourselves. Um, you know, I was happy to hear the secretary kind of talk about why we're here, but I want to ground ourselves a little bit with my story. I want to leave with my story before I get into there. So back in 2003, I was a young single mom, a uh, mom of uh, four kids at that time. And I had went to the grocery store to go just buy some groceries and it was really, I don't know if anyone in here has ever had a moment of being broke, like the type of broke where your car insurance up to date, you got a car but no gas. I was like on that type of broke. And I went to the grocery store to get some cash back. And I wrote the check for $100. And two months later, I had two police knocking at my door with my children telling me, mommy, there's cops at the door. And that day I got arrested for bouncing a worthless check. Two police officers took me to jail that day. And first offense, got out quickly. I thought everything was over because I paid the check back, I paid my fees, I went through the diversion program. But that day I realized my true sentence had started. Why did it start? I could no longer volunteer at my children's school the way I wanted to. I could not live wherever I wanted to live. And I couldn't even go to school. I tried to enroll in UCF and I had to drive all the way. I live in Orlando, I had to drive all the way to Port St. Lucie to get paperwork and depositions to just go enroll in college. And that was important to me because as we know, if you have an arrest or a conviction, you're precluded for over, from 45,000 occupations. Um, and we're seeing this across the country. I was just in Oklahoma last year and I met a young lady who was washing hair, doing cosmetology in prison, and was excited to come home to do hair because she knew that she would be banned and had a barrier to get into, um, into employment, and she was banned from just washing hair. So this issue is very close to me, is my lived experience, and I am the CEO of the Clean Slate Initiative, and what we're doing is making sure that people have access to a second chance by automatically clearing their records. So all 50 states allow you to petition to get your record clear. There's laws on the books, but we know there's 70 to 100 million people who have some type of arrest or non-conviction. 30 million people are eligible today to get their record clear, but they're, they're either not accessing it because it's bureaucratic, it's costly, or they don't know about it. And so what we've been able to do is work with partners, directly impacted folks, businesses, um, and even employers who've been lifting this issue up and passed legislation across the country to automate it. And so far, we have 10 states across the country that have enacted clean slate laws. So far, we have over 2 million people who have had their records fully cleared, and we're not stopping until we come to Florida as well. So we've been doing uh, the Lord's work, I would say, and it's about redemption and second chances. And the thing I would just say, um, I'm an organizer, I come from organizing, I live here in Florida, and even in Florida, I know y'all gotta have a panel talking about Florida, but in Florida, you're only allowed to expunge one non-conviction. And I will end it with this, because I know there's other questions. Um, a few months ago, I took some stakeholders down to an expungement clinic um, in Miami-Dade, and I partnered with FRC, and we were packing up. And it was this older couple that started to walk into the community center, and I just, I was like, they can't be here for to get their record clear. They gotta be here for something else. And the man could barely walk. He asked me, where do I go get my record cleared? And all I could think was, this guy's not trying to get his record cleared so he could go get a job or housing. This guy don't wanna be, he doesn't wanna die being defined by his record. So my hope is that we can remove these barriers give people a real chance um, as a second chance, and that employers will continue to like push for legislation, advocate, because there are a lot of workers who are looking for jobs, and there are a lot of employers who can't find good workers, but they're out there, they just need a chance. Uh, absolutely, and I think it's a great point that you made where even an arrest that did not lead to a conviction is something that you would have to petition and go through to get off your very record. And imagine going to an employer and explaining to them I didn't do that or I was arrested. The yes. assumption is gonna be you were arrested, you were guilty of something. So having those things just at a minimum cleared, not to mention that when someone does have an expungement, they are following the laws of the state that, that have you know uh, waiting periods and, and meet all these different criteria, but expunging it 
uh, and automating it gives them that opportunity to, to do things that they normally wouldn't have gone through that process to get it going. So thank you for the great work you're doing, too. Uh, Dr. Carey, um, you mentioned, um, I think we mentioned earlier, or, or you were in the video, and you were talking about research. Um, why don't you share with us a little bit of that, that research that's behind? Uh, it's easy to pull on the heartstrings to let employers know um, that, that you're doing the, quote, right thing uh, and how people can be loyal and dedicated employees. But, but tell us what you found out and, and the research behind Second Chance Hiring. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so I live here in Florida but work around the country with John, with individuals and businesses really focused on not only how do we um, get people job ready and hired, but how are they job steady? And there is responsibility on both the employer um, and the employee in that case. And so what research has shown is that when both the employer are working to create a successful environment and the employee is doing what they need to do to take care of themselves, then people not only are retained, long term, they're also frequently promoted, which you heard one of the um, guests on the video talk about. Um, so in terms of staying job steady, what I like people to think about is their own experiences in the workplace. Um, so the workplace can be stressful. Um, it creates uh, triggers sometimes for you maybe acting in ways in which you wouldn't have acted. But when you have individuals coming out of incarceration, which is an incredibly stressful and traumatic experience, you put them in a workplace and don't give them any supports around managing potentially mental health issues um, that were either occurring before or occurring after incarceration, substance use disorders, um, navigating or re-navigating relationships, returning to their communities. So there's this whole other piece in terms of retaining and, and promoting second chance hires around people's well-being um, that happens not only in the workplace, but outside of the workplace, um, but it influences how um, successful that partnership is gonna be. Um, so we work, again, with businesses to look at data-driven strategies um, for helping your second chance hires to be successful and we work with the second chance hires to make sure they're taking care of um, their own well-being and really reaching their full potential. And as um, John mentioned earlier, when this is um, working really well, we see healthier, safer, um, more prosperous, uh, prosperous communities. So thank you for being, let me, letting me be here today. Thank you. Jerron, we'll pass the mic down to you. This is our second panel in maybe two or three weeks, so uh, we're, we're, we're getting routine going. Amen. So, Jerron, you're with the Public Safety Solutions of America, yes. and you're a senior fellow at Right on Crime, and you've been going across uh, the country to major cities talking about the rise in violent crime, but not just talking about it, but offering solutions to, to combat the, the crime wave that, that we've seen in, in some of these major cities. Where does reentry, second chance hiring, where does this fit into that equation in addressing public safety? and our crime rates in general? Sure, so Public Safety Solutions, um, we're a coalition, right of center coalition that focuses on uh, four areas around public safety. Um, the first one being funding the police. The second piece is um, allowing for police um, to spend more of their time solving for violent crime and preventing violent crime. Um, we also look at evidence-based policy being our third, um, third policy. And then fourth, we have a smart on crime policy that puts public safety first. On um, the reentry part of it, um, can almost um, be used almost on four of those different princi principles. Um, for example, um, if we're trying to approach issues around violent crime, um, uh, the best way to kind of prevent uh, the, the, the um, police from spending less time on like nonviolent offenders is by setting up a reentry program so that nonviolent offenders aren't, aren't getting back into the system because they don't have opportunity. You know, um, same thing around evidence-based policy. Um, we've learned um, over the years from the states that um, if you start reentry um, in the prisons um, on, the, on day one, um, then th they're less likely to do crime when they go back home. And so putting the right incentives in place uh, will help them be productive um, inmates and also productive citizens when they leave. Um, but that's the heart of smart on crime policy, um, public safety. And the best example of that was something that I did in the White House working with President Trump was reforming our federal prison system 
Um, and we learned um, uh, reform efforts from the work they did in uh, Texas and places like Georgia, uh, where we saw them be able to shut down um, prisons um, and, and crime was lowered in those areas because of the way they reformed their prison system. And so we took that model on the federal level that when reentry starts, it starts on day one. Um, so we look at everything from the individual's criminology um, and then pairing them with productive programming that would reduce their um, recidivism rate. And the recidivism rate is their risk of returning into prison. Um, in doing so, we looked at things around education, um, vocational training, which is a heart of it, um, being able to keep resources, being able to spend more time with their families, um, looking at mental health, looking at drug abuse. Um, all of those things happened on day one. And if a person um, was to participate in that programming, uh, they could spend some of their time once they're classified as low to minimum risk to recidivating um, in cone confinement. And that's um, showed as a strong enough incentive that um, federally, um, where you see recidivism rates at like 35 percent, we were able to lower them to 12 percent. And so um, though we've done a great job here in Florida, you know, there's always room to grow. So and we learned that from the federal system that like we were able to re reduce recidivism um, from 35 to 12. Um, and we can do that here in Florida. Um, and what, what does that mean? for violent crime. It means that police and uh, um, uh, spend less time on nonviolent offenders and have more time to spend, spend on violent offenders and keeping communities safe. Um, but the, the reality is, is that even 95% of violent offenders are gonna come home um, eventually too. And so honestly, the programming need to go across the board um, to help people um, be productive citizens and not um, victimize when they come home um, and create safer communities. Um, but a core pillar of it um, is being able to work with private sector individuals because in many cases, um, people who are dealing with trauma or addiction, um, being able to be on a path to know that their life is meaningful and having a job that, that, that lets them feel productive is a heart of it. You know, um, and, and you partnering with faith groups or nonprofit groups um, um, from the beginning when they go into prison to where they come home um, creates that infrastructure. And so that's what we did federally. You know, we got an all above approach from working with the private sector individuals, churches, um, and nonprofits in the prisons, and then allowing that infrastructure of opportunity to translate into the outside. And so it's extremely important, but it also connects to public safety. Perfect. Thank you, Jerron. Can you take that here? <laughs> One rapid fire question. We'll start with you, uh, Dr. Carey. We, we're going to throw it back to you. When, when it comes to research, uh, what is the, the, I guess, what, what you were most shocked about when, when you were digging into the numbers and, and the data when it comes to second chance hiring? Honestly, um, when compared to people without criminal records, people, employees with criminal records are more likely to be promoted and also um, be retained longer. I was really surprised about that. But it's that, great. That is great. Sheena, uh, what, what are the, the biggest challenge that, that you're facing in the states when it comes to automatic record clearing through? You know, this is one issue that I would say that has a lot of bipartisan support, and we don't really see any organized opposition. But I think the, the, the biggest thing is maybe sometimes getting law enforcement to come along. Um, because in some states, I mean, I know you worked on the Louisiana bill, it is revenue um, for some of the departments. And so we just have to be more um, thoughtful, talking with some of our stakeholders on the front end around how we could just, just move around funds. But I, I think the hardest thing is just trying to get more law enforcement involved, but I, I think it is a common sense policy people get behind, so we've been having great success. And, and you touched on a good key there, that states have saved money mm -hmm. that have implemented automated uh, record clearing, and it also frees up time, with, what Jerron was mentioning, with law enforcement, too. So, yeah. Same oh. question, Jerron. What, what's some of the major pushbacks um, that, that you've seen when, when you've gone across the country um, pr promoting your, your four pillars of uh, addressing violent crime? Well, it's, it's more political because we have a rise in violent crime all over the country, and so um, a lot of um, uh, individual leaders um, are worried about appearing soft on crime by doing anything that helps um, uh, um, people who have been um, justice you know, involved. And so um, our thought process is educating them. Um, for example, you mentioned about uh, fines and fees um, and their budgets being controlled about that. You know, most, most times when we say everything about 
fund the police, people think that like, oh, so we're the opposite of defund. No, it's really um, um, more, it's bigger than that. It's, um, we think that like government's proper role is to invest in police departments and public safeties. And so um, there's no reason why um, the incentives should be there for police to, to focus on certain crimes or fees. Where if they have their appropriations there, um, they can spend most of their time um, doing the things we care about like violent crime. Um, because you look at clearance rates for violent acts such as murder, um, which is like 50% nationally or, 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 or crime, a sexual crime, is like 20%. Um, so obviously the police are, are really pooled um, in many di different directions where they can spend better time on it. And so um, the education is the big thing. Um, and, uh, and we live in a very political world. And uh, uh, unfortunately, um, either side of the aisle uses the, the issue around crime um, as an issue to run on uh, when, they're, when they're trying to be elected to um, any position. Absolutely. John, we're going to go for the short answer here. No and such I'm, thing. But, but I'm, I'm a recovering I'm a, litigator from New Jersey. But yeah, <laughs> as a trial lawyer, this is the shortest answer I could give. No, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you the tough <laughs> question. Outside of events like this, how, how do we dispel some of the myths that employers have about second chance hiring? I think uh, a lot of what Secretary Dixon's doing and Pat Mahoney by making sure you engage the business community early and often with education. And our nonprofit partners, those reentry programs that are building and sourcing candidates, making sure that they're up front in the conversation, listening to the chief human resources officers to script what they need. The CHRO should be telling the reentry programs, I need a candidate with these skills in this area that could do these things. And if we do that and they deliver quality candidates, everybody wins. Absolutely. Thank you all. Let's give them a big round of applause. Good job, man. All right, we're going to start with Patrick here. Patrick, I, I was reading the, um, the annual report for the Florida Department of Corrections, so um, I read that this morning. Um, I, I found a couple of things very interesting. It, it mentions one of the four pillars uh, and, and deterrence, and it mentions on deterrence that Bordering on the immoral is the practice of creating environments that fail to address the physical, emotional, and intellectual needs uh, of the population. Uh, and a little further down, there were 10 big rocks for, for the Florida Department of Corrections. And I love how number one was public safety or safety, safety of your officers, safety of the inmates. Uh, and safety of the, the, the people that work in and out of the prison. But the ninth one was rehabilitation, and it builds off of that whole uh, explanation of, of deterrence. Um, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to let us know what's going on inside of the walls uh, within the Florida Department of Corrections. What are you doing with the inmates to, to meet these needs, their physical, emotional, and intellectual needs, so that when they do come out, um, they, they'll have the skills that they need? Sure, appreciate that question. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Chelsea for uh, putting this together and inviting us all here to collaborate. And it's good, good job. So what I what I thought I'd do is uh, maybe give a for those that uh, uh, do not uh, know fully what the Department of Corrections does, and for those that do and in, indulge me, uh, it'll be repetitive, but. Um, I thought I'd give a little overview of what the Department of Corrections uh, does and what their responsibilities are, and then maybe a little bit about uh, what I'm responsible for with the Department of Corrections, and that'll probably answer your question, Scott. Um, so as you all know, the Department of Corrections is uh, the largest state agency in the state. Uh, we're the third largest correctional system in the nation behind California and Texas. Um, we have about 24,000 employees, 17,000 of them are uh, in the security ranks. So what's that, about 70% are in the security ranks. Um, the other 30% are administrative and uh, programmatic. Um, we have two houses of the correction system, our institutional side and our community correction side. Uh, institution side uh, supervises the uh, inmates that are in our correctional care. Uh, we have about 65 or so uh, prisons around the state from Pensacola down to Miami. Those include main units and annexes. Um, we, we supervise about 84,000 individuals incarcerated. And uh, on the community correction side, we supervise about 140, 145,000 
individuals on community supervision. Our probation officers uh, enforce the conditions that the court imposes on them. Um, I started my career uh, about 29 years ago as a probation officer, just like you, and um, in Broward County, uh, Fort Lauderdale, Pompano Beach area, and uh, being a, being a uh, probation officer was uh, an incredibly uh, satisfying, worthwhile uh, uh, position to, to work in. Uh, we had both sides of the house. We, um, we served as uh, public safety agents and we served as rehabilitative agents. So it was a very satisfying um, job. And um, our, our probation officers around the state do great, great work. They're kind of like our unsung heroes in, in the corrections field. Um, in terms of my responsibilities now, I, I oversee all the programs and reentry efforts for the Department of Corrections. Programs and reentry consists of four major areas. Uh, our Bureau of Education, which in, uh, oversees our academic education, our career and technical education, our uh, library services, special education, our workforce development, which we, we're really proud of, our workforce development initiatives that we're, we're doing. Uh, we, we engage, as the Secretary ind uh, indicated earlier, we're engaging uh, businesses and industries and trade associations like I've never seen before. Uh, the Secretary mentioned that, you know, in, 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 even in the video, we're going to invite industry into our uh, uh, prisons to uh, train uh, our, our population, uh, and we'll go as, so far as to move individuals closer to, um, closer to where the jobs are. So we're doing that like we've never done before, and we're, we're really proud of it, and we're doing it with existing resources. We never had, we didn't get uh, additional resources to it. We just kind of realigned our, our positions to do so. Um, so we're really proud of that. Our second bureau is our Bureau of Transition and Substance Use Treatment. Uh, that they're responsible for uh, overseeing the uh, treatment, uh, substance use treatment uh, needs of the population um, and uh, of the inmate population and on the community correction side. So we treat uh, individuals incarcerated for substance use treatment and we have uh, outpatient and residential treatment facilities in the community that treat our uh, community corrections population. Um, we do, I, I want to caveat this by saying we do great work. Our, our corrections officers do great work. Our programs uh, personnel do great work. Our um, teachers do great work. Our workforce development area does great work. We do great work in pockets. We, we are stretched thin. Uh, we don't have the scalability to reach uh, 84,000 individuals in our, in our system and another 145,000 in, in our uh, uh, community corrections area. Um, the, got two more areas. Make them quick. <laughs> uh, chaplaincy services, of course, that meets our, our, our spiritual needs. And uh, we have an area that oversees, our Program Development Bureau oversees our risk needs assessment systems. Um, so I, I, I ran out of time, so I'll... I'll that, that is perfect. Um, it's probably... So I think I answered your question. You absolutely answered my question. And my 10-minute intro took a little bit of your time, but, but that's okay. That's okay. I, I, you, you made some great points, and, and we'll come back to some of those. And, and one of those points is going to throw us right over here to Reggie. Um, you know, five years ago, w w when I was working in Louisiana, it was almost unheard of to have cooperation between DOC, outside state agencies, far less an outside nonprofit. Um, Reggie, you, you are with Operation New Hope. And while I was reading the, the annual report for FDOC, I also looked at your website. And, wow. and I love your vision. It says, Operation New Hope works to build a stronger community by creating opportunities to realize second chances and reduce recidivism. Let us know what Operation New Hope is doing to, to make these stronger communities and, and what you're offering people in the way of second chances and, and expanding the opportunities for them. Thank you, and thanks for having us here. Uh, I want to start off by uh, acknowledging our founder, Kevin Gay, is here. And I, uh, and he founded the organization 24 years ago, and, and I, I may pass the mic to him at some point to talk about you know the, the, the evolution of the organization. But I will say this, the, the other 
first shout out I got to give is is Pat Mahoney, uh, Secretary Inch, um, who's here, and Secretary Dixon because the work that we're doing uh, post release is great, but the work that we're doing pre release has is, is been phenomenal. Uh, they are, uh, as Secretary Dixon said, they're going out of their way to make sure that we can provide programming. I'll give an example at Baker Correctional. Uh, we were working with Florida Hires and the University of North Florida and Toyota. And so we wanted to have a warehouse and logistics program. And we thought, wow, it would be neat if we gave uh, our participants a forklift certification. So we got to let's do something crazy and ask if we can bring forklifts on site. And so we're like, it's probably not going to work. So we, we talked to the warden, and the warden was like, sure, let's do it. Let's figure out a way to do it. And so we do when we do the warehouse and logistics training at Baker, that we also provide a forklift certification as a part of it. And we do the forklift certification right on site. They've been great to work with. We're in about 30 prisons right now. And our goal is to you know expand, and we want to touch every single person that's coming out of a, a Florida facility, and even our county facilities as well. So we realized over the years, as we've evolved as an organization, that is so critical, not only that people have opportunities for second chance employment, but the other holistic services. So we realized, and Kevin tells us, could tell you the story better than me, like getting people a job is great, but if their sobriety is in question, if their mental health is in question, if their family uh, situation is in disarray, chances are they're not gonna be successful. So we've invested a lot of money uh, and a lot of resources into having licensed mental health providers, having, making family reunification a key component of what we do because we realize if we can stabilize the individual, we use a housing first model. Our biggest expense we spend is on housing because we know if we can get you in a stable environment, you can start rebuilding your life. And so again, the, the pre-release work that we're doing, the cooperation with the Department of Corrections has been phenomenal. Post-release, we want to grow. Our, our, our vision is to build a statewide network for reentry, and we want to be in every city. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a big goal, but we literally want to be in every city in Florida. So as people are getting out, we want to help them reacclimate back to society and be productive citizens again. Thank you, Reggie. And, and, and to get back to Patrick's point and, and what Reggie said, too, is using the existing resources. Uh, you have a great organization doing great work, and that partnership is, is what makes things work with, without us having to recreate the will. Um, and, and as you've seen as a probation officer, the trust between the individuals on supervision wasn't always with the probation officer, but nonprofits, outside organizations can develop that trust while probation officers can work on the public safety aspect and, and, and work with the higher risk that, that need that law enforcement uh, and, and need the, the tougher, stricter supervision. So thank you. Now we're going to move on to, pardon my notes here, to Carol. Carol, I did not read your website last night. And, you should not. It's and I did not read your <laughs> annual report. But I do, know, I do know some parts that are going on, and, and Reggie mentioned it too about um, the, the need of, of forklift drivers. And, and, and Patrick mentioned about DOC and the secretary mentioned about making the programming inside correspond with the needs on the outside. Now you're with the Builders Association? Yes. Okay, what, what are the needs and, and, and what have you and your organization been doing um, when it comes to second chance hiring and, and, and what are your thoughts on it as being one of the, the major industries uh, here in Florida? So first of all, I want to thank you all for having me tonight. Uh, Carol Bowen with Associated Builders and Contractors. We are a commercial construction association. We're also the largest single provider of apprenticeship education in the state. And so I just think there's a natural synergy here between everybody up on this panel and the panel before. And of course, I want to thank Chelsea, who I just do whatever she tells me to do. So thank you, Chelsea. Um, and two other full disclosure disclaimers. I am a lobbyist by trade. So when we're in the Capitol, they say you've got 30 seconds. So I'm not going to use my full time. Uh, nobody wants to hear me speak that long, but I'm also Sicilian. <laughs> That's right. I didn't intend to speak, but I'm going to for 25 minutes. I'm also Sicilian, and you don't get in between wine and cheese. So, uh, I, again, thank you for having me here tonight. I, I think I would say this. Um, for my ABC hat, one of the joys in my job is getting to speak before people and say, what is better than representing an industry where you can start with nothing, learn a skill, learn a trade, and carry that with you. And I'm always talking about the benefits that it brings to your life. And, and it has been probably one of our 
biggest shortcomings that we have not uh, gotten in deeper in, in identifying people who share that belief. It's the same exact thing. Who can we teach a skill to? Who can we teach a trade to that will then go with them? Uh, it's, a, it's something they can carry with them and give them a sense of pride and know that worst case scenario, you can help your family in your residential situation if something goes wrong, right? You're, th you're the guy that can fix the plumbing, the whatever it might be. But you can now go to work for a company who needs you. We are in dire, dire need of people who want to work in construction. Uh, a couple of statistics that are not on our website, and our website is because I'm in charge of it, so apologies. <laughs> And we don't have an annual report. Um, that'll be in my annual review. But I would say <laughs> I'm, I'm the least impressive person on the panel. 50% of our workforce is, ye is 50 years of age or older. And they, I mean, right, right, exactly. It's horrifying and terrifying. And, and while we say that, I also know that we are having arguments in Tallahassee saying we need vocational education back. We need to have trades in the school. We need to, we need to. Because the other thing that is an element of this conversation is students without hope often also end up in just involved circumstances. If we can be introducing skills training and trade opportunities in your middle school and let people know there's a future that doesn't have to involve college, we can also help prevent folks from maybe entering the four walls of, of where you operate. So I think, I think there's a natural synergy here um, I'm already talking too long. We, we have not done as much as we should in reaching out to groups that we can work with. And I think it rings true of all business entities. Businesses, especially in construction, operate under deadlines, timelines, and move in quickly. And there's not a lot of time to stop and do creative thinking. And so if I can offer my assistance in making us take a breath and, and pause and say, there are communities who want to work with us and we can be better about it, then I'll sign myself up for that all day long. Um, construction don't always get to be as you're under deadlines, but if we can be better, I certainly like to do so. And, and thank you for having me here today. No, thank you. And I'm sitting right next to Patrick here. They get 70,000 people placed on community supervision each year. 145,000 people in prison uh, programming there that I know they can do that can match the needs uh, of what's going on um, to, to meet the building. And, and that's, that's why it's a win-win situation. You need employees. There, there is a population that their freedom, their success is dependent upon that job and the wraparound, the, the housing, mental health. Those are the same issues that an employer has with anyone. You still have family issues. You still have substance abuse issues. Um, but we, we can show employers that we have groups that are working to address these issues. There, there's a ton of benefits that, that relate to, to second chance hiring. And I'm going to sling it over here to Erica that has been doing a lot of work, uh, great work, on, on engaging employers and getting those benefits um, to, to where in the employer's hands where, where they know uh, it's not just the heart but they get to see the data and the research. So let us know what's going on, Erica. Hi there, good evening, thank you all. I'm Erica Varian and I am with the Florida Foundation for Correctional Excellence. And as he mentioned, our organization is working to elevate the conversation directly to employers around the benefits and the perks. Um, and at a high level, everyone in this room knows what those are. We've already addressed those, but when it really comes down to making that happen, that can be a challenge because there are registration and there are deadlines and there are websites and there are how do we benefit from the federal you know, tax credits or bonding credits or those types of things. And so as he just touched on, our foundation is committed to elevating that message and making it relevant to employers in a really tangible way. So our organization and foundation is not just a nonprofit, but it's also a DSO, which is a direct support organization to the Florida Department of Corrections. So back in 2020, the state's leadership and government and the previous Secretary Inch and current Secretary Dixon and Patrick had a vision to create an organization that would work in tandem to this momentum that we're talking about in this room. So we're talking about this pulse and heartbeat in this conversation around recruiting people here to the table who can serve this population. And we know that employers are a big key part of that. And so FFCE was formed 
very purposeful and very strategically to bring employers and industries to our population. And so we lean on FDC and Patrick and the secretary and previous secretary and all of those leaders who were appointed and we listen to what they need and they have said, employers hear the benefits, they see the benefits out in the world, but sometimes letting their staff, their administrative, their HR teams really get in the weeds of making that happen. We have some amazing second chance employers in this room, in this tent tonight, who have said, I wish that my secretary or I wish my HR team would have known that that was what we needed to do, that that was the information we needed to ask that candidate early on at a hiring event, at a reentry seminar. So we've committed um, alongside Ride on Crime to, to creating a statewide checklist. And so we're going to expand that checklist to a handbook and we're going to make that tangible and easy to do. And so that's just a, a real kind of low-hanging fruit thing that we're doing. Um, Chelsea and I are going to work hard to distribute that in a lot of different vehicles, from the chamber to workforce to Department of Labor. And that's just, okay, she says it's here, and it's here. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to distribute that tonight. Yeah, she says it's here. She says we have it here. Um, and we're going we're gonna to continue using this, this blueprint to elevate the conversation with industries that have wraparound services. So these are organizations and people that can bring in the training and the teacher and the curriculum and the credentialing and the certification and the jobs. So the employers, you mentioned Toyota. You mentioned you know, these people who can bring in the wraparound whole kit and caboodle to offer to our population and so this is going to act as a guide for them to know what's on the other side whenever they're released. And so right now, the three key things that we're going to be driving to kind of meet this is investing in capital purchases that elevate the infrastructure around the highest hiring industries. We know construction is at the top of that list. And so we're investing in a Caterpillar simulator at Lowell CI where we're going to scale what we know is one of the fastest growing hiring, you know, fertile grounds out there. We are investing in technology. So we are purchasing D10 monitors to create hiring events so that we can communicate with these employers that are going to be educated with this campaign that we're going to be doing. And then we're going to be piloting some new programs in the community control and correction space post-release. So we're going to be talking with credentialing partners that we know work, like CDL, and people, the employers that we already know have a successful footprint so that we can scale what we already know is working good in the state. Thank you very much, Erica. If you haven't picked up a copy of the one-pager, <laughs> oh, before you leave, we're, we're going to throw the mic back to Reggie, and I'm looking at my timekeeper. We're able to... Rapid fire questions. Here you go, Reggie. You ready? Uh, <laughs> what, what would be the one thing you'd want to tell employers uh, about the importance of offering that second chance, that, that pathway to redemption for, for those who have paid their debt to society and are ready to move forward? Thanks. I, I think Carrie made the point when, when look, talking about the, the uh, statistics. Uh, we find, and we do, we're a second chance hiring agency as well, and we find that some of our hardest workers, our most committed people, are folks who are looking for that second chance. And so, I mean, we started years ago, and again, I wish Kevin would tell you, when we started years ago, it was like pushing a boulder up a hill, trying to convince folks, and we would say, hey, give them two weeks of, don't pay them for two weeks, and see how hard they work, or, or figure out ways to, do, hey, do an internship. And now, you know, the, it's changed. Things have changed, and it's and employers are more willing. But at the same time, you know, there's some folks that need convincing. So we have great employers who go out of their way, like Vistar in Jacksonville, went out of their way to create a program for second chance hiring. It was the first bank slash insurance industry that did that. It was phenomenal. And so I, I will say, you know, giving people a chance um, pays off in, in the long run. Thank you. Erica, we'll go back to you. Um, how do we dispel, dispel the myths um, and, and the stigma 
that that some because one of the things employers for reasons mm-hmm. they don't want to hire is mm-hmm. the stigma associated with it mm-hmm. and they're also concerned about their employees the existing employees and the mm-hmm. safety of those employees yeah. what, what would you tell yeah. an employer that yeah. that gives you those two concerns yeah um, I would start by educating them and telling them what we've talked about tonight that we have the biggest untapped committed workforce that there is and that if you give them a chance, um, that they will exceed your expectations, Um, that if you create a culture in your environment that is open to this population, that it will radically change the output of your organization and your company. Um, I would encourage anyone who is stacking those stigmas up to look in their inner circle and their extended circle and ask themselves, um, do, do I know someone with a criminal record? Because at the end of the day, we may not think we know someone, but we know someone. I am sitting here today coming to this space and gravitating to corrections from a very personal place. Both of my parents spent over a decade in and out of jail and prison. And I spent every bit of that time alongside them. And I can guarantee you that my first employer did not know that. I can guarantee you that my college professors did not know that I was taking time off to drive five hours to meet my brother to go see my dad. I wasn't open about that for a really long time. But when you have an internal champion inside of an organization who is willing to tell the truth about that adage of, let me be careful for every person I see by just a quick twist of fate could be me, that ripples inside of an organization, a club, a business, an association, So there are ways for us to get close and proximate and personal to these stigmas and to be passionate about the reasons that we have self-conviction and self-agency of why we're all here and why we do this. And so my my short answer is to, to be personal about why you come to this work and why you wake up every day and do this because any business or any HR director or any hiring manager who has a naysaying stigma, if you get just proximate to them and close to them and tell them the real reason why you come to this work, I think they would be hard pressed to tell you no. I, I agree. Thanks for sharing yeah. uh, with us too. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Go, it, it's okay. <laughs> well, Carol, how are you gonna top that? Again, the person, well, I'm a middle child. Also, I'm, middle I'm gonna I'm gonna make this one easier. Um, ha- have you picked up anything or learned anything new this evening um, that that you'll be able to bring back to the association? So I would say always, and I would say we are an industry that's looking and working, and I think there's always the presumption from construction. Well, we do public work, so we can't. We have this environment, so we can't. And I think there's a million ways we can dispel that rumor. But I also don't think our industry is that far removed from stigmas that we're talking about here tonight, right? We always hear, and I'm sorry, I keep doing that to the microphone. We always, it, through our national association, we have gone on tours, and I keep talking about myself. But when we go into guidance counselor offices, there are post saying, don't let your child end up here. And so there's Stigma, I know, right? <laughs> thank you, thank you. But I, yeah, it is. It is, it, we are fighting a national stigma of this is your industry of last resort. But I think we could be and what we should be is an industry of first opportunity for anybody looking for it. So there's a synergy here, let's do it. Absolutely, thank you. Okay, Patrick, now you have to top Erica and Carol. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to throw a little curveball here. Um, Secretary LeBlanc with Louisiana Department of Corrections always mentions the, the, the programming, everything that's going on from top down. Uh, but he also mentions changing the culture within DOC. Secretary Dixon mentioned it, that when he first started, there was a particular attitude 
um, that, that he had. And then at some point, there, there's a change. I, it's a tough question, and we'll take the short answer, but how do you address changing that culture within DOC so that everyone, especially probation and parole, even from the correctional officers that deal every day with individuals in, in your custody, how do you help facilitate and, and, and move them to share that passion that, that most of us here have um, to, to effectively make our community safe and, and to live up to your mission? Yeah, I think I think to meet that, uh, to answer that question is really a collaboration of what everybody's been saying, what Secretary Dixon says, uh, what Mark Inch says when he when he was our secretary, what uh, previous secretaries have have mentioned. Um, you know, the Department of Corrections has been in existence for 150 years, 100 and 200 years or so. Uh, it it takes a long time to kind of move that ship. We say we're like the Titanic. We move very slowly. Um, but we are. We're, we're making that shift. Uh, we have wardens and staff out there, correctional officers, that, that communicate with me uh, regularly on ideas they have in terms of programs and reentry and uh, how they can make an impact with the population. So it really starts there. And I'm seeing it. it it's, it's happening now. Um, it may not, not be to the extent that some of us want, but I could tell you uh, our staff in, in, our, in our prisons, our correctional officers, our probation officers, they all have a heart. They all have the passion to work. Uh, you, you have to be a different type of person to work inside of a prison. Um, you have to balance that, that security and you know, the, 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 the hard aspect of, of, uh, uh, of what we are as, as uh, uh, people that work with peop other people. Um, but I, I could tell you, as somebody from the Department of Corrections that works in programs and reentry, has the heart for rehabilitation, our staff, 99% uh, 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 of our staff out there uh, have the same intent that I do. Uh, they just have a different job and a, and a different mission to, to, to get there. So there you go. With, with a 24% recidivism rate, you, you've, you've got it there. So um, great job. Thank you. Let's give them all a big round of applause. So my name is Neil Voles. I'm with the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Uh, grateful to be here tonight. Uh, yeah, come on, y'all. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you for Right on Crime for organizing this great event. And you know, we've been here in Florida. We're kind of best known for passing Amendment 4, which restored voting rights for 1.4 million people with past convictions, just like myself, uh, who uh, made previous mistakes. And now we're really spending a lot of our time uh, on, on, on developing a constituency, empowering individuals, and trying to make society better. And a lot of that comes back to exactly what we're talking about tonight, which is how do we really engage second chance employment in a way that creates that win-win scenario in which employers benefit, individuals and families benefit, and then ultimately society benefits. And so I can't say thank you enough. I, I, I will say that most of our work is actually done outside of Tallahassee. Uh, we do a lot of work in municipalities and cities. We've seen four or five of our municipalities in, enact second chance employment policies from Tampa to uh, Broward, or, uh, Orlando. We're working in Gainesville right now, uh, but but we're in session, y'all. So I, 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 it's probably smart for us to bring up the fact that today we saw a second chance employment policy pass in committee unanimously. We know that there's a variety of bills that will help with seal and expunge, we'll, which will expand the expungement policy that you were talking about, in which we go we go from one to two. Uh, it's a long journey. Uh, we, get, we get it one step at a time. Uh, but we expect to see some of those things signed into law this year. And we also s expect to see uh, the narrative and the, and the conversation around second chance employment continue to get broader and deeper. And that's just what I want to say thank you for you because we know that we've seen three bills this year come about around second chance employment that we didn't, like, it, it came about because people care and people are getting educated. It's not like completely organized, like all the groups getting together and coming up with something. It's like, hey, we got an insurance issue that we got to deal with. We've got a, a trucker issue that we've got to deal with. And you see these bills pop up. And that's the consequence of real work at the, at the, at the, at the hearts and minds level where we can really engage intellectually and, and begin to see when we see each other as human beings first with real God-given potential that anything's possible. And I just want to say thank you to our 
Uh, so, uh, Chelsea, you gave the Irish man, a, you know, the, the the mic, and he's not. She's got to learn how to shut up. But Gus over there, and Amanda, thank you for hosting this whole thing. These guys own Poco Vino, and it's a great place to do events. So I'm going to give a shout out to them, and and our partners, Institute for Justice, SBLC, and the folks who are helping us with the job training or the job licensing bill. Thank you all. Uh, we're, we we wouldn't we, we wouldn't be having the success we are without you. So thank you. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank all and. I've got to have Frank Russo. Come on, where are you, my friend? Frank. Oh, there he is. Come on, Frank. I was standing by the bar, which is not the good sign. And obviously, I'm the coveted, and I've got the coveted speaking slot before the open bar, so I'll try to be quick. But uh, I want to introduce myself to all of you. I'm Frank Russo. I was previously the Director of Government Affairs with the National District Attorneys Association. So for five and a half years, I represented district attorneys, and I apologize in advance uh, for all of the good work they've done to make your lives difficult. But they are great people, and I'm really excited now to be with the American Conservative Union and CPAC. Thank you, Chelsea, for bringing us here and allowing us to learn so much. A little bit about what we do at CPAC at our Nolan Center for Justice. We're focused on three pillars like Jerron. First is we really care about public safety. Second, we care deeply about accountability, not just for the individuals, but for people uh, it, who are going through the system, but also for the government. And then third, we care about human dignity. And I think that message gets lost a lot in the conservative community. So what I'll be doing at ACU and CPAC that I think is going to be incredibly helpful to the work that you're doing in Florida and across this country is help build law enforcement-led voices. We're going to put a coalition together of chiefs of police, of sheriffs, of prosecutors who think like we do, who need to be giving this message that you all led so brilliantly to the communities. Law enforcement needs to lean into this space. And so it's time to get that started, and I'm really excited to be with ACU. Please come pick with me and use my business cards. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. When a person goes to jail, their family goes to prison. But that's, that's fine. And the fact that if they deserve it, but the point is when they go there, we want to make sure that they get the kind of assistance, especially if they're going to get out. Because our U.S. Constitution and state constitution requires that under equal protection due process, they will get out. We want to make sure when they do that if you're in a darkened theater and uh, there's two or three people that have gotten out of prison and it's your daughter, granddaughter, cousin, niece, whatever, these people have gotten the kind of skills developed that we're talking about here. They've been reemployed. They have a stake in their success. So smart justice is not about the taxpayers. It's about their well-being and also about the taxpayers. So Tax Watch has been very involved for a long time, about 12, 15 years on this and other things. And so very we look to see that how this affects the citizens and taxpayers of Florida. I think that's the value add that we bring. But all what you're doing is phenomenal. I want to see how we can have a tax credit for employers, whether it's corporate income tax or some other tax system. And I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Um, and it phases out over time, like a, you know, a smart credit some year, and then fall by 80%, 60 20 uh, 40 20%, and it's gone. But the key is make it sustainable and make uh, create the incentive that would not otherwise exist, because without the private sector, this is not going to work. I hear this from our Department of Corrections. We know it will not work without the private sector fully behind it because we in the private sector and the taxpayers have the most to gain to lose by it. Thank you all very, very much. You're doing a great job, and we love you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now that he said that tax thing, I'm a little, I just want to circle back, though. Tool time tax happened last year, so maybe we've got something going on here. Also, we need to give a little one last shout out to Sal Nuzo from the James Madison Institute. Come on! But hey, I love, I mean, y'all, I, I, again, I'm sorry, I just want to, I'm going to give you the third, but I'm coming back in because I'm not going to close it out. Sal's going to close it out. No, I'm not. Okay. But I'm going to actually acknowledge a good friend of mine and partner in crime over here and talk about um, a program and a bill because ultimately at the end of the day we're at the Capitol our job is to influence policymakers and help them come up with good ideas and one of these good ideas is something and I'll kind of backtrack a little bit they're saying about you know how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time some of these policies are really big great ideas 
Some of them are on the on the margins, but they have a really, really big pronounced impact. So uh, Christian Camera uh, with Chamber Consultants is uh, it, this was really his idea, uh, an idea for a restricted barbering license to lower the ability or, or increase the ability by lowering the regulations present when a person potentially is incarcerated, learning how to barber, coming out. They don't have ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars to go to barbering school. They don't have two thousand hours or whatever they lowered it to to get a barbering or a cosmetologist license, but they have the skills. And that's what's important. So something you may not have even thought about, it, it, it has a pronounced impact on getting people employed, which as we've all talked about, is the path to lowering uh, recidivism. So House Bill 1251, uh, Susan Valdez, and what's the Senate companion? Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. If you are, if you are passionate about this, go fill out a card. Go wave in support. Let them hear that this is something that the legislature can do that impacts individuals as they're returning into society. So that was the only thing I wanted to highlight. I, I can't uh, thank this woman enough who's really just kind of doing yeoman's work session after session after session, keeping folks like all of us sane, reasonably sane. Thank you. Just complimenting him, like just keep going. Uh, again, all right, y'all. We got a few minutes left on the clock. Have some wine. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you guys so much for coming.